They're all back together, and I hope we survive long enough to see the outcome. I'm Matt. I'm Luke. And I'm Max. And this is Force for Thought. All right, everybody, welcome back to Force for Thought. We just watched episode seven of Ahsoka, and, you know, the past seven weeks now, we have based six weeks, actually, before this, we kind of go around and, you know, say what we thought about it. So, Maxwell, what do you think about this episode? It was really good. It it was the first one in a while that didn't absolutely blow my socks off. I think, you know, I think I'm going to say this one is a nine out of ten. Luke Taylor. I still give it a ten, I guess... I'm going to contradict myself. I would still give it a 10 out of 10, but I agree. This is the first one that has not... It's not just that it's... It's not that it's a worse episode in terms of, like, the writing or directing or action or any of the qualitative or objective measures of a TV show. It's just that there wasn't a massive reveal or something like a bombshell thing that happened. And so there was not, like, a moment that really took my breath away in this episode, but I still loved it. Wow, guys, I could not disagree more. I think this might be my favorite episode of what? Just taking the wind out of the sails. Last week, every week, Luke's like, I don't want to be like a donkey brain, but it's 10 out of 10. I'm I'm not going to say anything. It was 10 out of 10. This is just the first episode that was not a distinct improvement on the one before it. Correct. It it only suffers from the fact that the two episodes before this were so incredible. This episode was really good, and if if this was just episode two or three or whatever, then it would absolutely be a 10 out of 10. I have nothing bad to say about it, other than the other two episodes that came right before it were just a little bit more epic. I agree. Episode yeah, okay. one was amazing. Two was better. Three was better. Four was better. Five was better. Six was better. And then and seven we started was off like with as, a ten out of ten. So at some point, and then seven was like as good as episode two or three or four, which I did love. But the last couple of weeks have just been so spectacular. They have been. But here's the thing: I think this one we're rewatching. This is still going to be a standout episode because I think all the other episodes are super heavy on reveals and plot twists. When I think when you're watching it over again, you're going to understand all of those things. And for me, a lot of the times when you're watching something that is not saying that Ahsoka is dependent on reveals or anything, obviously the show is very good, but I think I agree, but my reaction kind of is sure, (laughs) which maybe isn't (laughs) fair. No, no, no. no. I know what you mean though, but I think we're rewatching it. This episode is going to be like, finally, we're not, I'm not having to sit on my edge of my seat. This episode I loved specifically because I know I said it when we were watching. I was like, the casting is perfect. Watching Sabine and Ezra in their little turtle shell. Um, I think that moment alone, it's the smaller moments for me that really build Star Wars. And I love the entrance of Thrawn, right? I love uh, the entrance of Ezra, but I think the smaller moments of them just being friends and getting along, and that's mm-hmm. jumping so far ahead. We also obviously get C-3PO, uh, which we debated a lot about, which we should we should get into in a little bit. Um, you know, we, we get Mon Mothma as well. I mean, we kind of glanced over that even just while watching. Uh, we get a little bit of Chopper. I feel like this episode has had so much in it, you know what I mean? And I think we... we Shin and Balin just kind of d- depart. Like, what is that about? So we'll just start from... I'll, I'll say this real yeah. quick. There is a difference between things that, you know, I like on a first viewing uh, that are different when you rewatch things, right? I remember um, going back just to the first episode that we reviewed and we were talking mm-hmm. about how, uh, like, that first uh, scene um, when Ahsoka was putting together that, pay, that puzzle um, and uh, we were talking about how it was a little bit slower and I was even saying, like, yeah, but mm-hmm. I like that because it lets us... Like, yeah. stay in that moment and like breathe in that like environment and everything and live in that and the first time i watched it i did really like that however when i go back and i rewatch it i start to get that feeling of like okay i've I've seen this before like let's hurry this along Mm -hmm. i don't know why this is taking so long yeah so this episode as like a first time viewing Mm -hmm. i think you're right like there's there's no like major reveals or anything like that which is why i'm saying like oh well it wasn't as good as the last two episodes right because when i'm watching it, i'm like give me more give me more whereas yeah. when i rewatch it i'm sure i will appreciate this episode a lot more because it helps build to what will ultimately be an incredible finale in the next episode yeah i agree it's it's kind of a bummer that we do our format in the way that we do it because right after the episode are we're so emotional for lack of a better word that we're just reactive and really making our opinions by the seat of our pants so i'm ex- I'm excited to come back and revisit ahsoka as a whole after all eight episodes are released maybe we'll do like a one year later review like we did with kenobi and maybe my opinions will change but this is still a spectacular episode of television i don't want anyone to go around thinking that i did not love this episode of ahsoka i did 
Yes, it's great. So let's just start from the beginning, I guess, then as well. Because so we enter, right, with uh, Hera finally kind of answering to, <laughs> I was going to say her crimes, but that's not true. But answering from to a certain point of view. Yeah, from a certain point of view, kind of answering yes, to her Senator crimes. Senator Ziono, he'd probably say that. Exactly. And so we're getting these characters in person. And Ziono was a little bitch when he was talking to Hera back then yeah. and so now I think he's equally that guy is I was also... defending him then I'm gonna defend him less now he was he was less a little bit good. more rude this time we I think you wanted to defend him because we know his son who's the main character in resistance and we're like oh yeah he's like a great rebel so you assume that his dad has that same kind of credibility but it's like what are you what are you thinking here man like yeah. why why are you not giving Harrison Dula this war hero general any sort of benefit of the doubt well, the first time, all of her claims were unsubstantiated, and then this time, Mon Mothma even said there was an incident on Sitos, and Ziodo is still just kind of denying that. I got real uh, Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix vibes, when he's like, no, no, it's not a problem, even though there's starting to be a discernible amount of evidence that should prove that there is. Great the Harry Potter reference, thank too. You. The, the incident on Sitos that he just washed away is... A lot more substantial than he's giving it credit for. I also think that that actor is playing it up a lot. Like, he's the one thing that sticks out to me a little bit. Because he ends every sentence kind of the same. Like, I'm just like, well, he's really playing his angry character in that one note a little bit. He doesn't. <laughs> it was a little too hammy for you? Yeah, uh, yeah, a little bit. I think in comparison, when you have Mon Mothma, who also is playing so beautifully. <laughs> it's really hard. Yeah, I'd like to talk about Mon Mothma for a minute. I don't Please. remember if I did when we had our Andor review. I'm sure we did. I'm, I, mean, I know we talked about her, but... That would be a crime if that went specific, untalked about. This specific <laughs> thing is that there's been a lot of talk over the course of our lifetime on recasting the same character with different actors and whether they look the same and bridging timelines. And I just like that I, at least from what I've seen on the internet and at least in our minds, or at least in my mind, I guess, but the conversation that the actor needs to be aged up or aged down depending on the time period. Mm -hmm. We're just sort of, we're just done with that. Yeah. Like this is canonically 15 years after Andor and it was clearly shot the same year that she filmed all of Andor. Rogue One, she looked a little bit younger. The prequels, she looked a little bit younger, but not as much younger as she should canonically. And I just like that we're all okay with it just being Genevieve O'Reilly, no matter when it is. But she has her hair tucked behind her ear on the one side. So... That's equivalent that of her age, wearing that glasses. That ages her up 15 I was, years. Yeah. I was going to say the exact opposite, actually. I was going to say usually they show some sort of difference in their hairstyle just to show that time has passed, whereas yeah. I feel like this is like the exact same hairstyle. Yeah, even. no, I agree. That's a great point, Luke. I honestly, for some reason, didn't even put that together that obviously, yes, this is way past those events. Mm -hmm. um, that's a little upsetting, I guess, but I, I'm, I'm the okay opposite. I'm glad we're done with that. It's it's Mon Mothma. Yeah, Move because, on. Because there is like this trope, yeah. right, where like if a character is aged, they have a beard or they have glasses, and it's like <laughs> it doesn't. You you see through that quite quite often now, so it's not it's not worth it. Yeah, and uh, the same thing with Bo Katan that she is what canonically like fifty or sixty in the Mandalorian because she was a full grown woman already in the Clone Wars, <laughs> and everyone was just okay with that. Yeah, and I like that. I like that too. I think it's a great call. Also in this scene. We get, I think, um, you know, Hera saying some great lines. Um, I, I, I'm chopping this up a little bit, um, but I don't, she says, "I don't know what frightens me more: the possibility of what might hap what might happen, or your inability to see it." And I think that's a great. She says that to Ziono, and I think that's a great line because I think that is a, a the basis of Star Wars, right? And it's like the fact of like this is going to happen. So what can we do? But you get all this pushback, whether it's politically, whether it's people just like different interests. And I feel like that sums up Star Wars really well on this on this battle side is that no one's on the same side until it's the absolute last minute and you have to be. And there is a war. And I, and I love Hera's storyline in this whole season, which is just trying to prevent a war because she knows what's, you know, what the cost is when you do have a war. Um, so I do I do love her story arc in there. And then also um, we get C-3PO. With within within a moment that out of this whole show, usually be like, oh, C three PO. When R two D two showed up in Mandalorian, we all freaked out. When C three PO showed up, it's like we've already seen Hayden Christensen. Right? We've seen we we have. <laughs> there's so many things that we're like, oh my god, Jason's and Dula's in this. Like we have all these things. So like C three PO weirdly is the least interesting pop up. With that being said, I do love the implications of him. You know, working with Leia, and I love seeing Leia being more inter 
intertwined into this world and seeing Leia, you know, even be mentioned amongst the ghost crew in live action is really exciting. And knowing that in this galaxy, right, we know that obviously, but out here, she, her Leia's actions are affecting Hera as well, which are, uh, you know, two of, the, two of the coolest characters. But And it was such a good way to use C-3PO too. I, I really liked it a lot um, because, you know, it makes sense that we get something on Leia during this time period uh, of the New Republic, and they did that in such a good way where they don't really have to address Leia or bring her in because then it's like, you know, you, Carrie Fisher's passed away, so you can't, like de-age her you can make a completely cgi version but then with her passing away there's a lot of questions that a lot of people yeah. wouldn't like about that i just think using c3po was the cleanest and most creative way to resolve all of that and <laughs> still being fun and cheeky i agree I, I agree it's like um the age thing with modern mothma where if it was a, like a perfect universe and we could age the characters and bring back any character we want like it could be more perfect but given the restraints that we know they have when we get something like this i'm just okay with it like again when um sabine is catching ezra up on the galaxy and he says and the emperor died and she says that's what people say yeah that, it's like, that's that a very the metal perfect, line we I all know. laugh that pretty is the hard perfect at that way to explain that though because yes he's dead that's what people say but to the fans it's like we're not committing to it and but that's one of those things that we always talk about is that it's just filling in those gaps which is just like i know it's like in retrospect writing but like again as a Star Wars fan, you just have to come to understand a certain perspective, right? A certain point of view. Like, that is in the original trilogy. You just, that is the basis of what this fandom is going to be, which is going to be wonky, and we're going to back turn it every t- every turn because we don't know what could be better yet. And so I think that line right there is, is perfect Star Wars to be like, oh, yeah, let's just, like, lay those seeds now. So when our kids watch this or when our kids' kids watch that, as the whole, they're all like, oh, yeah, they did mention, like, four things throughout those and- yeah. The, yeah. Speaking of filling in the gaps, that's what Star Wars is best when it's doing. You know, like the Clone Wars as a whole is just filling in the gap from that throwaway line in A New Hope. Yes. And when <laughs> they started doing the sequel trilogy, I remember that that was such a jarring story jump to go 30 years in the future and then say, oh, by the way, when the New Republic took over, they started uh, demilitarizing immediately and mm. denied the existence that the Empire would survive and that the First Order would come about. And it's like, at the time, that was such an interesting story beat to just gloss over. That seems massively important, and you yeah. just ignore it entirely. And it's the same as the Clone Wars, that they come back years and years later and start explaining it, and it's a great story to tell, and there's a lot of options they can go with it, and I'm so excited to see it. I agree. Uh, we also get uh, a line from, I, I, I'm not sure which council member i'm gonna say ziono said it but it's just imp- I, be- I believe he was the only other one that talked that makes sense unfortunately uh he's like, imperial remnant such a term do you guys have any imperial remnant um thoughts because i think in general this podcast started with a very in the first episode luke's like i'll host it and then it in then divulged into just madness about the imperial remnant we discussed the imperial remnant at nauseum yes go back to to our very first episode about mandalorian season four theories and you can hear more you can see why i'm a ziono apologist because i was <laughs> saying that the imperial remnant is over and done and we're done telling stories about it and we are the thrawn thing is new and different it is I indeed. was right. I am vindicated by that more than I'm not. Go re-listen to it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so also we get the chopper freak out, which is really cool. That I was th- hilarious. That was probably the funniest part in the show. He, yes. Which he freaked out. Which, now, I'm going to bring in some of my own personal experience here because I'm an attorney. And he freaked out because Senator Ziono said, oh, we're just going to like trust new evidence from a droid. And from a legal standpoint, I'm like, hold on. Wouldn't a droid be like the most reliable person to provide this I type of evidence? I was literally going to say the same thing, yes. I was like, you should he... absolutely be trusting droids to provide this type of evidence. I was thinking the opposite. Wouldn't he be the most easily tampered with to change their memory banks and or modify them they don't have any sort of modified by who a human you can't trust humans any more than you can droids yeah i agree with max so it's the same thing. or not human but a sentient being i should say sure so it's uh, well and i guess if it's no the same, i think i don't think droids droid. have any less credibility in a court of law in star wars than any sentient being should yeah i agree because no, i think they can be programmed to do things I guess that's true, but they also, I mean, it's, I feel like it's so But in this harder. instance, what was he doing? He was just handing, handing off a message. C-3PO in particular has very famously been withholding information on the basis that his programming would not allow him to translate Sith speak. So it just, I don't know. I don't trust him. I don't, <laughs> I think it's a fair basis in the legal system it to is, not trust a droid as much as you would trust a sentient 
organic. I don't think I don't think it's as easy to hack a droid any more than it is to hack any sort of computer system or anything in the real world. I think we see it in Star Wars a lot, just like you do in classic action movies that take place on Earth when people, like, quote-unquote, hack into a system. It's like, okay, yeah, like, you see that for dramatic purposes and everything, but every time they go to a droid smith or somebody wipes a memory droid or whatever, I feel like that's actually very rare in the Star Wars universe. Either way, it was a really funny moment. It was uh, a really funny moment. And we, also, and we could see Chopper. Um, and also the, the last thing I was going to say about this scene, specifically we should move on because there's a lot of, that happened in this, but is the costuming is great. Um, they are dressed in different attire. And it feels like they're in court, even though it's basically just a cool jacket that you would wear in like a Mission Impossible movie. Um, I like the costuming a lot because it was distinct. The, the color palette was toned down as well. Yeah, so I was, was trying nice. to think, do we ever see Hera in a different costume other than her prisoner costume and her rebel flight suit? No, I think those are the only two. I mean, obviously, there's when she's younger, we get those episodes. Um, mm-hmm. But other than that, I would, I would say no. Because um, you mentioned seeing her ears was jarring. I don't know yes. if we've ever seen her ears. Yeah, it's they're just little nubs. Uh, and all it, Twi'leks are. They, yeah, but it first <laughs> just stuck out to me so apparently. In That's this. interesting. Yeah, I didn't even realize that we never saw those before. Yep. She's usually got her goggles on. Exactly. Yeah. Um, moving on though, we get uh, a great we get Anna, we get Anakin Skywalker back a little bit training from uh, a hologram, which I thought was yeah. I know, it makes me feel so stupid because I said last week or the week before that I don't think we'll get to see any more Hayden Christensen in the show and why w- that was such a easy to include uh, scene so applicable to Ahsoka's character and what they're trying to do with her as a character in the show. Yep. that scene worked perfectly. It did. It was great, and I also like how she laid the the groundwork to be like, oh, he made twenty of these. Or and 19. you saw one in Rebels that when mm-hmm. in season one, Ezra was looking at one. So we've seen or season two, two so, out of I think she said nineteen, uh, right? So twenty. No, she said did she say twenty? 20. So we have eighteen left, and that was the last one. And I have a feeling that those are going to be sprinkled throughout somehow, right? I, I uh, feel like at, we just finished episode seven, so I don't no. know. Maybe not in this show. But yes, yes. I th- I feel like Dave Filoni purposefully wrote that line because he wants to be like, eh, in case I need to pull this back out yes. again in another show and at another time or something. If, if some of it's not going to be actual physical training, right? Some of it's going to be about like the his like the mental training or what he's gone through or something, yeah. and it's going to be a tearjerker at some point, I assume. Very much like. In Last Jedi, when uh, R2 replays the message from Leia uh, from A New Hope, I feel like there's yeah. there's just gold right there, right? Like, I wouldn't doubt if they filmed all 20 messages right now to be like, let's just kind of circle through these just in case. Let's film 50 alts and just see what works because no one knows what they are. It was very smart. It was a, a good way of doing that. Um, and it was very reminiscent of the training that Anakin provided Ahsoka in Tales of the Jedi. We actually went back because I thought that it was that same training, uh, but it was not, although it is very similar in substance. Um, <laughs> There's, real quick, when you say reminiscent, I, last week I mentioned that one of my favorite gags lately in this in the, on this podcast is to say, oh, it's, it's very reminiscent of blank, and it's something <laughs> very obvious. <laughs> There's a moment from last week's episode where you, after I say that, you say, yes, and then this scene is very reminiscent of this other thing, but you're being serious about it. And after you say it, there's a five-second pause where we all, I think, sit and be like, was that a joke or not? <laughs> and that you just did it, it again. It was not, because I don't know that. I don't, I don't remember doing that. <laughs> it's very funny. I re-listen to it. Uh, at least it's funny to me. And I feel like the same thing's going to happen this episode, where you say reminiscent. I'm, I'm waiting for the joke now, but it never goes. No, there's no joke. That's And that's a deep pull. That's not an obviously, like, Thrawn was obviously supposed to be reminiscent of the Emperor's entrance. But this is, no. <laughs> this is a deeper pull, saying that Anakin's training was the, reminiscent of his training from an episode of Tales of the Jedi. The Mr. Mr. It's a deep pull. Mr. Reminiscence over here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hear that every time now too the force for thought fandom is going to get confused maxwell we have to come up with different verbiage <laughs> um but then and then the uh ahsoka uh, you know is in the space whales which i think is hilarious i feel like that's equivalent of saying like light sword uh space whale and i agree and they keep saying yes yeah, so but, it's starting to grow on me but i know it, it, it really is, threw me off at yes first. it did i don't see i didn't even catch it last episode but in the recap i was like that's weird because i feel like we've been saying burgles for forever now this whole episode this whole show uh and for some reason thrawn just refuses to say it um but then they come out of hyperspace and they are in the midst of a minefield which i thought was really cool and you know n- you know, as we as we know, um, I'm the resident dum dum, I guess maybe. But I'm just thinking about how long it took to set that minefield up. I mean, it is vast throughout the entire thing. They were they were uh, op, um, they had some sort of remote control, or they could fly. They were crashing in on the could they fly, ship. or were they like magnetized? That, I couldn't tell. 
what's what's the difference if you got your magnets working right? You can send them out there with magnets, have them repulse from each other. I've thought about this a lot with the people complaining that the last Jedi has those bombs drop like on, if they had gravity. But if you just yeah, have don't get me started on that I, argument. I will because if you have magnets and you have them repulse and the bottom layer repulse from the layer above them and then they will fall and then you start repulsing the next layer from the re- layer above them. Magnets are a really good way to handle a lot of space travel. And I think that's how they could have done this. And you have your MFA in magnetry, correct? Yeah, I I've, I study magnets every now and again. <laughs> I don't want to get too sidetracked into my defense of the Last Jedi, but why do people have to say that though? People say, "Oh, it could be magnets." It, it's also artificial gravity. They have gravity. Yeah. Also, they could, just they could, could just fall. Anything. They just fall. People are like, "Oh, there's gravity in space now." Yes, there always has been ever since 1977 when A New Hope came out. It have could, you ever watched a John Claude Van Damme movie? Just to, if you once you see one, if you watch Time Cop, nothing else will bother you in cinema ever. <laughs> They're fantastic Time Cop's movies. Time a bad example. That's a great one. So, yeah, Time Cop is the best example. I have yeah, silly me. Well, um, that that. But regardless, that's my answer. They sent out the mines out there with magnets, and that's how they got him so perfectly spaced. Is also yes. magnets because it looked like a magnetic field to me. Yeah, I just I just think that's just something like my wife would like love to set up is uh, space bombs. <laughs> uh, but th- I think that was a really intense scene. We also get. I also. This episode really doubles down on Ahsoka the White. Um, she Every time much she more says loose. something jokey or yes. witty, I get so happy. Same. And, uh, like we were talking about before, it helps that we spent so long with Ahsoka the Grey when she was so stoic and reserved. Ahsoka the even Grump. Though, <laughs> yeah, it's even better. Even though we were complaining about it and saying we wanted to be snippy and snarky again, now that it's here, it just feels so much better. Because it it's earned. Does. It is earned, exactly. And it's like, I didn't want her to start off like that, but the fact that she got here is so good and didn't take yeah. multiple seasons or anything. Um, and the most important part of that uh, bombing sequence was that the Pergil left. Yes. And as soon as they did, we were because we were suspecting that she was going to just hop back in a Pergil and take them back to the normal galaxy. And as soon as they left, we were like, Star Wars proper. Huh. Wonder how they're going to get back now. Yeah, I'm still wondering go, it. They all got to go back in the Eye of Scion somehow. Or at least the people that are going back. <gasps> yeah. Oh, oh. We'll and get then, there. We'll get there. And then I something else that I liked was Hu Yang is actually giving actual like thought behind everything. He's just like, this might not be the galaxy. This might not be anything. And I think that's something that I've never really thought about before. But combining Jedi, who are these mythical pe- people that believe in the force right and believe in like a, like a destiny and a certain way of living and that it'll guide you there is a very interesting contrast to a droid who is very analytical almost the complete opposite and i like that combo and i've never i mean obviously it's, it's it, you know very obvious i think with like with with like with 3po and luke and uh, you know i think that's why they kind of butt heads sometimes but i really like the ahsoka and huyang dynamic and i think that it shows really well here but i like that they're not stubborn like luke and 3PO were very stubborn from each other, right? We're like, Ahsoka and Hu Yang are consistently working with one another and understanding that he's a droid, he's 20,000 years old, like, I'm going to trust him and his in his intellectual uh, aspects, and he's going to trust me in my like mythological a- aspects of who Ahsoka is as a person. And I think, I really like that dynamic, and I like that he was bringing up all these points, and then she was basically joking with them, and it's like, yep, because it always works out, and they're a team now. Um, and I, and uh, I really like that dynamic, um, he says in there. And to go back one second with um, Hera, she says to Mon Mothma, we have to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And I think that is also another very good line for a what, what would sum up Star Wars in general. Yeah, from that scene, I also really liked the line where Ziono says it's... Um so it sounds like a children's fairy tale. Yeah, hey, it does. You know, it's a, we're watching a children's fairy. That's what Star <laughs> Wars is, and just to have that that's funny in universe explanation of it sounding like that. That's got to be how so much of this sounds like. Because I've always yeah. thought about that uh, with um, the the fall of the empire. Mm-hmm. Because I w- I was r- really wondering in the sequel era when it, the sequels were being released in my life when I was um, living that time what they were going to do about uh, the Vader being redeemed, if that was ever even going to come up, because yeah. no one knew but Luke, but Ray knew that Luke saved Vader. And I've always thought about that. Like People are going around telling the story about how the rebels defeated the Empire, and then Luke is there like, yeah, actually, uh, the Empire was a wizard, and so was Darth Vader, and so am I, but I, re- I redeemed Darth Vader, and then we killed the Emperor together, right <laughs> before they both died on the Death Star. And that just seems like such a story that no one will care about and no one wants to hear about like all right dude take your 
fairy tale stories and get out of here. Like the, yeah. this rebellion just won a war. That's what's important. Would you uh, gives it a lot more reason as to why they think like the of the Jedi and Luke Skywalker is a myth later on, right? And I think also gives more credence to Sabine's line that we already talked about, where they said that the Emperor is dead, and she said that's what people say. And it's like because really no one has proof of that. They just like you said, like Luke just kind of said like, oh yeah, the Emperor is dead. You can take my word for it, and they all did. Apparently, that's what people say. Uh, well, the rebels knew that he was on the Death Star. New in quotes marks but even that it's like yeah he was on the death star are you sure yeah we heard he was but are you sure right that's i i do love that aspect of star wars that the galaxy is so big that it is incredibly hard to to have the, the information be all correct and would you say that the fairy tale um aspect is reminiscent of who yang saying in the galaxy far far away yeah it might be <laughs> yeah. um yeah anyway uh, and then we also get to see Thrawn in his prime. Um, eh, I don't say in his prime. I think Mental- he's well past his prime. I, I, as I said it, I know. But I meant like, I just mean... In his we, element. We Yes, thank you, Maxwell. In his element, we get to see him so calculated. I mean, his last line when he says, Ahsoka lost, or Tano lost the one thing that she could not afford to lose today, and it is time. And I think that he is able to see everything beyond... A body count beyond winning and losing battles, he is able to see the bigger picture, which makes him the biggest threat. That is not anything necessarily new, but what I will say is that I think it's new to the show because um, we have, you know, he's only been in one episode, uh, and so people that are hopping on and watching now are understanding him clearly. I think because he has his battle map out and he's looking at what looks like, I don't know, Halo Wars. <laughs> um, which is a strategy game. And then Morgan, I feel like it's just being like, I don't know what I'm looking at, but it, I do love that contrast of her being like, we've lost, you know, she doesn't, everything looks a mess. And yet he is not worried one bit. Um, it, it's, it goes to speak to what we were talking about last week. Also that he's not easily rattled when he was conducting that battle. And he noticed that Balin's goal wasn't there. And he just noticed that and said it aloud, but he didn't let it get to him or anything. If that's me and I'm the general, or well, Admiral in this case, running this battle, and I see Balin's goal is missing and not fighting <laughs> with me or against me. I'm like, what the hell is happening? This yes. is a problem. Yes, it definitely is a problem. Um, and he also uses the Night Sisters again, which is great to 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 kind of smoke out Ahsoka from hiding in the 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 space whale bones. I can't not say space whales now. I think was it's that good. was that his intent though? To He's, smoke. He her. said, "What yeah. a surprise." Or isn't this a surprise? Or something like that. He made it sound mm-hmm. like he was not expecting to encounter Ahsoka again. I think when he they, he purposely got her out of there, out of hiding, he says. Oh, sorry. You're talking about Thrawn. Yeah, what are you talking about? That. I thought we were talking about Balin still. When Balin oh, confronts no, Ahsoka. Sorry. We're, we're still ahead of that. Yeah, I was I was with you. We were talking about uh, Thrawn using the Night Sister or the Great Mothers to find Ahsoka. Yes. I was kind of hoping they would do something a lot more Night Sister magic y because mm-hmm. in Jedi Survivor, you team up with a Night Sister and there's a lot of cool um, Jedi and Night Sister team ups where they like use the they teleport and they bring green fire and I was hoping to see some of that in live action, like uh, kind of the space battle where they use a lot of that green fire magic stuff. Yeah. So I was a little bummed that that's all they did. They just brought out their little red. For sword. now. They brought out their little red lines and pinpointed yeah. her um, because I know they can do so much more. So I hope we get to see more of them or I hope they get to the galaxy proper and yeah. repopulate Dathomir. I think they will. I, the, it's also something very satanic about them. I know they look very satanic, but even their hand gestures and stuff are very satanic. Um, and I was thinking, about, this is a weird turn and I don't know if I want, I mean, that's isn't necessarily cuttable but i've been you know as i'm always thinking about why i like star wars and i still feel like it's a mystery to me and myself a little bit and i think something that like kind of when i was watching this i was like maybe there is something about the the afterlife or the or the, the greater good of the world or something that it was is it within star wars at its seed that i i still haven't cracked yet and it keeps drawing me in and there's something when ahsoka is reaching out to um sabine and then sabine is also reacting to uh, to her, there's something I don't know if this makes any sense to you guys um, who also grew up Catholic, such as myself. <laughs> but I feel like as when you, when you're like a, when you're almost like praying, I feel like that you go to that kind of headspace that she's going to when she's trying to reach out to to uh, Sabine. And I feel like I don't know if this makes any sense to you. So if not, 
that's okay as well. Um, but I feel like for me, it was like, it felt like that moment when you're trying to reach out to something, right? She's obviously respect, expecting a response. Um, but there's something about that in Star Wars that is like seated that I'm trying to figure out still mentally. Um, also, Star Wars is just fun. So that's another reason for liking <laughs> Star Wars. But uh, there is something about it that I still have not cracked um, of why I like it so much. It keeps pulling me in. And I think that's some aspect of about it. Um, yeah, I agree. There's definitely parallels to real world spirituality and Star Wars because I mean, Harry Potter is really cool, but it's not as relatable to our life mm-hmm. like the Star Wars galaxy is. And you can struggle with the fight between the light side and the dark side within yourself and giving mm-hmm. into hate and all that stuff is very human struggles that we, everyone can relate to. So I, yeah. I know exactly what you mean. I, you, I think that often about Star Wars as well. Yeah. Like, like that Qui-Gon Jinn quote, your focus determines your reality. Yes. That's, a, that's a great Star Wars quote, but it also pertains to our world quite literally. You mentioned that, yeah, in the, in the quotes episode, the quotes cast. Um, anyway, to get off topic, Max, do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> Sorry, I just want to, I want to put you on the spot. Nothing, nothing that'll keep us on <laughs> no. track. No, I can only think about how Harry Potter is also very relatable, but I want to keep this on track. Yeah, Star I, I was going to say the same thing. Like, I uh, one of my least favorite coworkers doesn't have a nose and is super pale, looks like a snake. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we all have that coworker. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, um, was I, I know I mentioned this in the beginning of the episode, but one of my favorite moments is just Sabine and Ezra catching up. Um, I. I just love seeing them together in live action. It's perfect casting. Um, I just love them going back and forth. I think this might be one of my favorite moments from the whole, uh, the whole episode. Um, I think it's just a small moment, but it's a small things that make me really happy. And this is definitely one of them. Yeah. I'm really glad that a lot of people are loving uh, the characters right off the bat and all of the um, castings for it but it really makes me bummed about the whole um, actor strike that's going on right now because none of them are able to like talk about any of this stuff Um, and luckily uh, very recently they announced that the writers uh, guild struck a deal and they're working on doing all that and then hopefully Mm -hmm. the actors uh, will kind of follow suit here shortly and they can start opening up and talking about it but I'm really worried that that's all going to be finalized you know like a couple weeks from now and then by the time that people can start opening up about it people are like oh yeah soka has already aired yeah yep well luckily everything uh content wise is going to be delayed for several months to years so maybe we'll be able to get to a talk about soka for a long time i don't want to think about that we're, as we're a gonna st- have to milk this hard i don't want to think about that as a star wars fan or professionally <laughs> so <laughs> let's move on um there was another uh, line from Thrawn that I forgot to mention when he is when he says Jedi are great at hiding. They've been practicing that for years. They sure have. That's a great <laughs> line, and exactly, Luke. Right? It's like it's so funny. It's like yeah, we that's all we've seen. We've seen Yoda hide. You know, we've seen Obi Wan hide. I was we've hoping seen... you would even make a comment about how only the surviving Jedi are the ones that are extra 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 good at hiding. Yeah, because that's the only way they survived. Hmm. Uh, hiding and go seek would be a great game for them. Jake Pastor is a perfect candidate to be a Jedi. Um, <laughs> Only reference you and I would know. Um, and then we get Balin Skull and Shin Hadi separating seemingly for the rest of the show, I guess? Yeah, that was I don't know. That was a left turn from what I was expecting. I liked it. I th- I do think that they're that Balin Skull just doesn't think Shin Hati can handle whatever he's about to do. She's either too emotional or too reactive, but, not disciplined enough to do mm-hmm. what needs to be done, whatever that is, whatever his goal is, mm-hmm. which we still have no idea. And I bet he's kind of bummed about it because he was, like Max, you mentioned while we were watching, he's been training Shin Hati for at least a while. I yeah. I would assume years, but I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be that long. But he's just cutting her loose because she is a failure to him, but essentially. she He doesn't trust her to come find this untold power. But it didn't, It kind of came out of nowhere. I'm interested in watching it back to back because I feel like last episode she's asking questions. And he's like, it's going to bring us power greater than whatever and it's like it's always about them and them too and all of a sudden he's just randomly on this hill once they find ezra and uh sabine and then she he's like all right bye she kind of keeps mentioning references though to like military power and thrawn and all that stuff so i I feel like they have been hinting at that that that's like what's uh uh shin has in mind Mm -hmm. um and that's what balin even told her right he was like go ahead kill them and you'll like assume your place next to thrawn basically um but his advice to her which would definitely felt like parting advice which is why we think that they're splitting up for good when he said that your eagerness for victory will guarantee defeat it definitely feels like something that's like a final word right like yeah remember this last lesson and then he's on his way but going back to what 
Luke said, like he he was training her, and I'm assuming he didn't just do that like altruistically. Like he had yeah. to have been getting something out of that for himself as well. So why did he train her? I kind of got that vibe last week. I didn't really put it that far into my mind because I thought it was just a fleeting moment. But Damn. when uh, Shin Hati said, when ba- when Balin was talking about the uh, Boken Jedi that were trained in the wild after the fall of the Republic, and Shin Hati was like, is that like me? And Balin was like, no, I'm training you to be something more. I thought that was like a day one question. Like, <laughs> yes. he's got to be so exasperated. Like, no, Shin, this is what I've been telling you. This is not what we do. That's like Poe We've been doing this for 10 effing years. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that makes sense. That, that In that moment, he was like, oh, my God, she knows nothing. <laughs> Would you say um, Balin Skull giving, her, giving Shin Hadi her last kind of piece of advice is reminiscent of Ahsoka and Anakin and him giving her his last piece of advice earlier in the episode? Yeah, there's definitely parallels Yeah, I, 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 I can see that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's going to be the last one, I swear, <laughs> this episode. I don't want to overuse it. I just think it's funny. Um, but then, yeah, she, you know, Balin Skull sends Shin Hadi and the non-Tuscan Raiders um, just after Ezra and Sabine. And these adorable little creatures I keep forgetting the name of. Yeah, the um, they they teamed up with those not Tuscan Raiders pretty easily because in the last episode they just kind of like saw them on the ridge and they were like uh, something to the effect of the enemy of our enemies, our allies, or whatever. Yeah. And then we just kind of see them paired together, and I really want to know how that conversation went. Like <laughs> yes. he walked up to there to them who don't speak basic. Yeah. And he was just like, "Hey, listen, I know <laughs> you guys don't know me, but I'm going after that person. You're also going after that person. We can really work something no, out." No, I know how it went down. He just walked up to him. And opened one hand and closed a fist in the other and said, Ezra. <laughs> <laughs> and then they went, yeah, Ezra. <laughs> and they slapped their fist into their palm. And they said, all right, we're going to go fight him. Let's get it. That's exactly what happened. They also love in Ahsoka showing that the bad guys are wearing red or gold. They love red and gold in this show specifically. Everything is gold and everything is red. Um, which is which I also feel like is a, you know, color knows no speaking bounds. And so they probably can be like, yes. Or, well, don't, reddish lightsaber. Don't press me on this because I don't know any examples off the top of my head, but I feel like red is a common trope for like bad guys, right? But I like the gold edition. I feel like the gold is different, and I do like it a lot. The accents and all the stormtrooper armor and like all the imperfections on the chimera. I, I mean, the devil the eye of is run. Yeah, that's a good example. <laughs> the devil. Welcome to the religious episode. When you think of, when you think of the devil, what color comes to mind? <laughs> Do you think gold of the devil? No, red. No, red. Oh, I thought we were talking about gold. I, no, I said don't press me because I can't think of an example of why red represents evil. Oh, <laughs> yes. Don't press but me. But I like the addition of the gold, too, because the gold is different, I feel like, where I haven't seen that, but it's really cool. But, uh, you know, Ravenclaw. Uh, nope. <laughs> Ravenclaw, the most random house I got to name. Gryffindor is also red. And Is this our third guys. Harry Potter reference this, this episode? This, Every now and then, yeah. we pick a weird... IP to reference within our own podcast. A couple weeks ago, we made like three Seinfeld references. Back the Bizarro to back to Jerry? Back. Yeah. <laughs> I was going, why is not Bizarro? But there was multiple in there for some reason. Oh, was like, I'm just, I'm we watched it, that earlier that day or something. That was on our yeah. mind. I'm just glad it's Harry Potter and not Time Cop because I have not seen it and I was, oh. down, I was worried we were going down a track. Luke, well, we should go down that track. For, <laughs> for years now, Max and I have been watching every single Jean Claude Van Damme movie and there's like a hundred. Way too many. Um, And so it's, you go through. With when you get into the, the JVCD route, you have to go through with thick and thin. And trust me, there's a lot of thin. <laughs> the only Jean Claude Van Damme I've seen is that episode of Friends that he guest stars on. Never seen any of his movies. We should include that. There's um, a lot less gratuitous sex in that episode. Yeah, there's some good ones. Inferno. Um, <laughs> anyway, so we get this slow chase battle scene, which is somehow more enthralling. Enthroning. I said that before. It's still not working. Um, I disagree. I think enthroning is hilarious. Okay, I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say it's it's enthroning to watch, even more so than the uh, the mods chase <laughs> through a city. Yes, because they do this better, right? The the mods chase. They're on those speeders, and you presume that those are like high speed things, but they were just going so slow. This they're going slow, but they're in like these armored tanks, essentially. They right? look slow. So it was it was fun to watch that interact with the speed of these not Tuscan Raiders on their howlers. We also have characters we care about. <laughs> yeah, that's in that bumps. Because in that scene, I'm realizing there's. No, I'm like, I don't care about the mods. I don't care about the guy. The guy from Veep. Like, it's just so weird. Um, but then we also get Ahsoka jumping out out of of, of her ship, and uh, you know, I love the sliding stairs. I think that'd be mm-hmm. a really fun slide <laughs> to be on. Um, and you know, we are just expecting, I assume, for her to go 
and start, you know, instantly into the battle with um, Sabine and uh, and Ezra. But what do we get? We get a little bit of Balin Skull content as well. I love that. Yeah. We, I didn't see it coming. It makes a lot of sense. Did you think his lightsaber got redder? Yeah, I did. Did you? Yes. I didn't want to say something because I saw, I thought it would uh, sound dumb. But he, it was like distinctly orange in the beginning of the yes. series. And it, I thought it was redder. Yeah, I agree. It does, I don't think that makes any sense. I don't think it is, but it does look more red. Maybe once we find out what his final plan is, the fact that he's coming closer and closer to it is doing something to him. He's reviving oh, cool. Sith. I don't know. Don't, I've, don't, don't play know. into that. That's the <laughs> no, problem. No. Every, every episode. That's your thing, Luke. Every yeah, episode. You're like <laughs> I give an outlandish th- fan theory. <laughs> and that and, is and so then you dumb. have to immediately cut us off from thinking but about every, it. But every week, you, we, I think about it. <laughs> like, like, oh, man, that is true. Uh, but we still don't know what it is. What is Balin Skull's final motive? We don't know. But this is the second encounter that he has had with Ahsoka. There's one more episode after this. I'm thinking, and part of its optimism, uh, that Balin Skull is going to have a third and final encounter with Ahsoka in the next episode, and he's going to die. I, 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 part of me thinks that he is going to, whatever he is doing involves him sacrificing himself. Is that maybe me wishful thinking the fact that we won't see Balin Skull ever again one more episode? Ooh, that's interesting. But part of me thinks that he's going to give himself up for whatever that is. And instead of having Shin with him, he's maybe giving her a chance to get out by leaving her behind. Again, I don't know what it is. My only thing Ooh, is, yeah, and I the like fact that. that Thrawn mentions that Anakin Skywalker was um, uh, Ahsoka's master, yeah, if, there's, I mean, Star Killer is just in my head, right? I'm like, it doesn't make any sense that he'd be in this galaxy, but like, is it something to do with why does why did Thrawn react like that? Like, we all know, obviously, Anakin Skywalker, Darth Vader, but at the same time, it's like. I don't know. Is there this underlying Star Killer? You know, you want it to happen. It is. He does know. By Star Killer, you mean Galen Merrick? Yes, yes, he is. Yeah, from the Force Unleashed video games. Um, Mr. Force. We we do know from some of the uh, Thrawn books that uh, Thrawn did work with Anakin Skywalker during the Clone Wars, and he did later find out that Darth Vader is Anakin Skywalker. So by him knowing that Anakin Skywalker was Ahsoka's master, he does know. All that, all of those implications. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. I just can't tell. I mean, that's a, that's great to know as well. There's more history there. Um, we also get a great line from Balin Skull, uh, and there's a, like that's a moment between Balin Skull and and Ahsoka where Ahsoka says, uh, "I don't have time for this," and then Balin Skull says, "That I know," you know, implying that he's gonna murk her. Um, and I think that's a great pompous line. Mm-hmm. Be like, yeah, I know, and it's because it's coming come quick, and it's a great late saber battle too. And I think Ahsoka. And Hu Yang comes in, you know, for the, for the, uh, for the save, and with our starting line, which is, well, they're together. I hope I survive long enough to see the outcome. That was a good line. Which is such a fun line. Which is why I use it in the opening joke. I was a little surprised that Balin Skull didn't lose that lightsaber battle a little more decisively. It was like they kind of reached a stalemate, which I guess in terms of storytelling, like she loses the first one, ties the second one, and she'll presumably win a third one maybe. Mm-hmm. But I thought she was going to mop the floor with him after getting that extra training from Anakin and. Yeah coming like emerging out of her cocoon from Ahsoka the Grey to the White and I thought it was going to be a very distinctly different fight. I think it's a stretch to call that a tie. I would say that he beat her again. She didn't die kind of like she did the first time but he did like have her dead to rights basically and she had to uh, rely on um, Hu Yang basically really? trying to shoot at him. That's so he didn't have her dead to rights. No. They, were, they were in a stalemate. I No, he like had both of her hands like she couldn't move. They were they were interlocked lightsabers with one hand, and he was holding her hand with the other. But she was just as much holding him as she he was holding her. I thought. You know were what's they? funny? I, it, I, I thought took, he had her dead to rights. This is very funny. You took it as they were dead. You're dead to rights, and I took it to that Ahsoka won that battle because I mean her saber was really close to his face. All you need to do is a flick of a wrist, and he's dead. I took it that well, she he was won her wrist. <clears throat> That's funny. I gotta rewatch it now. I don't want to pause on the scene right now, but hit play, pull it up. You, you'll you'll be able to see. Um, well, going through while we're, this is going, see, I don't know, dude. Like, ah, he's you're holding her. That, uh, did you, did you, they're holding. Did you they're this? holding each other. Yeah, <laughs> he's holding her wrist, so you can't. Oh, you could do that. Um, <laughs> that is yeah. not a good podcast medium. You got to cut that. They don't know what we're talking. About. Matt's flicking his wrist for those of you at home. Yes. Um. And then, oh man, we should. But start. no, I think I think uh, Ahsoka would have died had Hu Yang not come in at the last second to try to shoot Balin. 
No. Uh, he didn't really try to shoot him. I think he was trying to make a distraction. Yeah, he whatever. deployed flares, it looked like, which yeah. was odd for Star Wars. I don't know if I've ever seen solar, or not solar flares, but distraction flares like that. Who distraction flares. Um, something else that we have, uh, I'd see almost a bigger thing is that, you know, Ezra doesn't want a lightsaber. He, I love the moment where he's like, no, I give this to you. This is yours. And I'm glad he didn't take it back. But I mean, him using the force is so cool. We've never really seen an actual fight with just the force. Yeah. With that being said, I would have taken that saber or taken the blaster. Cause like worst case scenario, you have it on you. Yeah, I mean, it worked out, but it was pretty close. If Ahsoka didn't come saving the day, that was a pretty arrogant choice by Ezra. And we all presumed he might have Kanan's saber. Luke, do you want to give more insight into why we thought that as well? Yes, the last time we see Kanan in Rebels, he he dies. And um, Arinda Price, the Imperial governor of Lothal that ordered him to be killed, um, gave Grand Admiral Thrawn his lightsaber as proof of death. And that is the last time we see the lightsaber, so... We assume that Thrawn still has that lightsaber aboard his Star Destroyer. Perhaps Ezra got it during their time on this galaxy. If not, Thrawn still has it. I think one way or another, it's going to come up next episode. I agree. I think it has to. I also... Man, I just lost my train of thought. And it makes a lot of sense as to why uh, Ezra wouldn't want to accept his lightsaber. You know, I feel like they're teasing that, basically. Yeah. Yes, I, because they're also teasing Ezra's death, which, which I don't, I'm sorry to get ahead, but no, do it. that was a pretty ominous ending to the episode where he s- s- talks about how he's excited to go home. That is like, I'm going to die 101 he in said, any s- sort of movie or two. Yeah. It was even more on the nose than that, though. He said something to the effect of, I'm starting to think I might go home after all or something like that. Yeah. Which is funny because the entire time he's thought he was going home. Well, and, you know, we didn't talk about this as much as we should have in the last episode, but one of the first things that uh, Ezra said to Sabine was, uh, I'm excited to go home. And that was the first time where they kind of hint that, and you're like, ooh, I don't know if he is going to make it home. But I feel like we didn't talk about that as much as mm-hmm. we should have. And then they brought it up again, and they ended the episode on that note. Yeah, all of us kind of I said this clenched up a little bit, like, ooh. No. Earlier, but I think part of, you know, I don't want this to happen, but there's the, the, the opportunity that... Ezra sacrifices himself in order to make Sabine and Ahsoka go home. I hope that doesn't happen because I think Ezra is so interesting. He's so cool. We are only getting two episodes with him. I just don't see them killing him off three episodes and being there only. I know. The more I think about it, the more I could see it, though, because he had all of Rebels is about him, and he had a very satisfying character arc throughout that show, and Sabine was left as, like, the next character at the end of that show. Mm -hmm. And Ahsoka yeah. sacrificed herself for him at the end of Rebel Season 2 on Malachor, and this mm-hmm. would be a nice callback to that. He oh, sacrificed God, himself to her. it would. But then at the same time, it's all for nothing. Literally, it's all for nothing. They find him, Thrawn gets released, and then they leave without Ezra. And so it's all for That's nothing. That's true. That would know? be a whopping failure of yeah. a mission. Like, it, I don't mind failures in Star Wars as we've and talked about. And then he would about. never get re- reunited with Hera, which I know. would be too sad. Or Zeb, let's be real. No one cares about <laughs> Zeb, but We you. all care about Zeb. <laughs> You gotta mention this episode. Did that make you happy? Are yeah. you satisfied now? He's training he recruits. Name dropped. Now we just need a mention of Callus. We do. Oh my god! How have we not brought up Callus? Uh, you shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> the leader of my draft, 2023 draft. <laughs> um, a segment we probably won't ever do again since it's still the least listened to episode <laughs> of this podcast. Um, then we get the the Shin Hadi versus Ezra and. Uh, uh, Sabine fight is really cool to see. Um, I am constantly rooting for Shin Hati. I just want her to win every single battle that she's ever in, even if it means stabbing Ahsoka, stabbing Sabine mm-hmm. again, or stabbing Ahsoka for that matter. I want her to win every fight she's ever a part of. And they yeah. offer her a chance to, for Ahsoka offers her her hand to join them, and she runs away, but I super think she's going to take her hand next time she's offered it. I'm, that's what I'm wondering. I would love to see Shin Hadi kind of end up being good and more of a great Jedi, you know, somewhere in between. Mm-hmm. And maybe, Start dating Sabine. Sure. <laughs> and then if, uh, you know, just not seeing... Ahsoka's obviously a, a good person, right? And she's not a Jedi, but she's a good person. I'd almost like to see the antithesis of that, which is potentially Shin Hadi being a great Jedi, but not you know, leaning more on the, the bad side of things and them having like this kind of uh, Catwoman Batman um, dynamic mm. where it's like, yes, they, they're, they semi have the same goal, but they go about things vastly different. And they, you know, I mean, obviously Catwoman, I guess don't, doesn't have the same goal, but she's a good person that does bad things, um, which I know that's a little bit repetitive and the whole Dexter thing, blah, blah, blah. Like, is he a bad person doing good things or a good person doing bad things? Um, but I think that dynamic could be interesting. Catwoman and Batman is, the, the dynamic that I would I would set up. 
Yeah, I, no matter how you cut it, either any of those scenarios involves more Shinhati content going forward, so I'm yes. on board for it. I r- really do think she's going to be redeemed, though. Yeah, part of me thinks so, too, but she also, you know, seems to be worse than Bale and Skull. <laughs> is so, it worse, though, or is it like child soldier syndrome, where it's the only life she knows, and she's never really been given a choice to be good? What know. life does she know, though? You say that like she's being trained as a child soldier, and I feel like what you said earlier proves that Bale and Skull is not trying to train her that way, and that the fact that she still doesn't get that is frustrating to him. Yeah, I mean, she's moderately child soldier. She's young and has been trained for, I'm still saying years, to be a dark side force user. They obviously they do tap into the dark side of the force. We um, how old do you think she is? Like supposed to be slash in real life? Because like, uh, I think an appropriate age to start dating Sabine at the end of the series. <laughs> Why do you think that's going to happen so strongly? I think it might happen. They, they do you honestly think that's going to happen? They or do you are just giving want that to romantic happen? vibes to each other. I that when she was staring her down in the cockpit of the ISIAN shuttle, I got some. I like you. Do you like me? Vibes. I don't know. I can <laughs> I don't see it think happening. Anyone else got that? Luke, how how old are you right now? Uh, twenty six. That's okay. That's what I thought. You were born ninety seven. Yeah. That's exactly the age Shinhadi is in real life. That is Luke. You got a shot. <laughs> oh man. As a married man, the child. He, <laughs> I just mean like it's weird to meet Max. You were talking. Do you think about, she has her Padawan braid in real life? I, <laughs> I think I think in you mentioned this, Max, and with sports, it's like, wow, we are significantly older than these people now. But seeing characters on screen, like part of me is still like, yeah, I could do that. I could, you know, I I could be in Star Wars universe and that and whatnot. But I'm like, I, why do I feel like I'm more like Balin Skull's age now than Shinhadi? <laughs> I know it's not that big of a difference, obviously. Yeah, that kind of deflates my child soldier theory because even if she was trained for months to years, is what I said before, maybe years at most. That still she could have lived a. a relatively full and fulfilling life up till age 22 and then got picked up by Balin Skull. Exactly. That's what's so weird. I just seeing these characters and being older than them <laughs> is a very odd dynamic. I think I relate more to Thrawn than Balin when people are like, oh, well, Thrawn got a little pudgy, huh? I'm like, let him go. <laughs> He's had a stressful couple years. And did you see a bunch of comments that were like, oh, out of all this budget, none of that went to Thrawn's wig. <laughs> His wig? Yeah. I don't I, I, he, I noticed that it was his natural His, his hair. appearance. He did not have a wig. They his appearance does it. not bother me. Um, man, there yeah. was something I, mean, I, I, I get earlier. it. I, I also have uh, cartoon drawings of myself with a six pack. So, Thrawn, <laughs> I get where you're coming from. And, and you know what's funny? I drew them. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so we get Thrawn's, uh, you know, when he's talking about time and, and what uh, Ahsoka has lost. Um, yeah, I want to see these characters get back to Star Wars proper in order to kind of i don't know just say this is a multi-season thing getting ezra has been on our mind since 2015 Mm -hmm. i'm glad it's kind of ending so we can move on to be like i don't even know what's next it's um the the structure of the show as it seems to be panning out is kind of reminding me of the mcu going forward how um at the end of endgame cap gave his shield to the falcon Mm -hmm. and now there's going to be a new captain america movie with falcon as captain america and if you want, you can watch the TV show in the middle, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, where yeah. he didn't accept it and then he did accept it. But, you know, the, the big fans can watch that show and have a deeper appreciation. But if you're just watching the movies, it's like, OK, and now he's Captain America. And I'm kind of getting that vibe with this where, mm-hmm. OK, Thrawn returned. I don't know who Thrawn is, but he's here. And if you want a deeper understanding, you can go watch Ahsoka or then you can go watch yep. Clone Wars and Rebels and then Ahsoka. But I think he's just going to get back into the galaxy, and then it's going to set up perfectly the Filoni movie that's going to start filming, I, think, I so. think, as soon as this writer's and, tri- and actor's strike is over. I think. Well, the writer's strike is over now. Oh, not over. Probably a couple weeks till that they can actually start getting back to work, but I think I'd love to see where this goes because I we talked about how this is going to be a multi-season show, presumably, or this story will bleed into other shows or some sort of IP, and... I, I just feel like we need more before the movie. We can't just have Ahsoka, the show, and then the movie, right? I feel like we need to have another season of setup or something. Depends what the movie is. But I know. But then we can't, if we did the movie right away, there's no way there's going to be a season two of Ahsoka if the season one was just all set up for the movie, you know? Yeah, I don't know. And I also want to see Ezra be part of that because it almost feels like, feels like he. He deserves it, and then we as fans deserve it. Because, yes, All Rebels was about him, but we've already seen him being like, no, this is about you, Sabine. This is your saber. I'm fine. Mm-hmm. And so I like that he is giving – He's he knows he's not the main character, right? Um, Maybe it's false hope, and I don't want to make my second MCU reference in the 10 minutes, but it also reminds me of Age of Ultron when they were teasing us with Hawkeye's death the whole movie, 
and they kept doing like very on the nose this character's gonna die yes. beats like that the whole time and then he didn't die at the end and that mm. was the twist so maybe that'll happen maybe so maybe Ezra will be fine and they just want us to be scared a little bit for this week because I'm definitely scared and uh Maybe he'll be okay, and everything will be good. Oh uh, yeah. man, how crazy would that be if they're they're teasing, in my opinion, blatantly the possibility of Ezra dying, and then last episode Ahsoka herself dies or something? I'd be better Ahsoka's with that. Never, Ahsoka's never dying. Yeah, I I think so. I think when I first came into it, I was like, maybe Ahsoka will die, so then Ezra and Sabine can go on. But I think you're right; it's her show. I don't think she will die unless I would she say, does die, and it's a one season thing, uh, and then no, no, she's not dying. I was thinking at the beginning of the show maybe Sabine will die, but they have not developed her character enough to have a fulfilling character arc for her to die they, at the end of this series. There's I, only one more episode, and I feel like they still have a l- multiple episodes worth to go of yep. Sabine's story. I will say this show is great, obviously, but what has happened, I think, is that we've been introduced to a bunch of new characters or, you know, we're being, oh, well, we, we have, uh, you know, Ahsoka went through his massive change and that kind of halted everybody else's storyline. So Sabine, really, her her character stopped. Which is dev- fair because it's a Soka show, so she should 1, get first right, yeah. And, but like, uh, but like Sabine was like really being developed, and, and she kind of halted since episode four. You know, we don't really see her at all in episode five at all, and then in six and seven right now, she's kind of like, yep, she found Ezra, her mission's complete. So now what? And so I feel like she's we, we they she, they've kind of halted, which is fine. Same thing with Hera; she doesn't really developed much i mean she's just kind of being her usual great self so i think she'll have a massive opportunity to develop once the war of thrawn actually does come um but yeah it's, it is odd like that's a great point that i feel like they have kind of halted story structure or storylines uh for development in order in lieu of kind of finishing this up and yep they found ezra that's their mission and i would see what happens also ahsoka also says and die for what to miss this reunion or whatever it's a great little moment. She's very happy for someone who basically kind of betrayed her, went with the bad guys, left yeah. her for dead, and then also is just inherently bringing a new war to her, their galaxy. Yeah, that goes to show the character development that Ahsoka went through uh, while Sabine was away. She really got adopted this more forgive and forget because she was not there at the beginning of the series when no. Sabine boofed the map over to uh, Shin Hati and Ahsoka was pissed for kind of a while. But now that she's just like, she's focused on the good. She's excited to see Ezra. She's not mad at Sabine, even though she has every right to be. Yeah. They look like they're at Burning Man in this screenshot that we have on <laughs> screen right now. Yeah, those uh, the the naughty little turtle hermit people vessels that mm-hmm. they ride around on, super cool. Yeah. I was worried that they were gonna have to like pack this up and walk around with huge backpacks like campers. And <laughs> this is a this is a really cool uh, ship design. I like that. You you got that word N O T I from the subtitles. Let's just agree to say noti until we hear it because it sounded like you said naughty, and that immediately came with sexual implications for me. Interesting. Right, Last I'll say week no it was, these this week naughty it's sexual. little turtles. <laughs> these naughty turtles. What would you say about the, the non-Tuscan Raiders? The like Nazi? Skin Raiders, yeah. yeah not Skin Raiders. Sounds like Nazi. That's your second thing, Luke. It's always throwing in a, ra- a wild card idea and then saying <laughs> things that are potentially sound like other things. Um, but I think that was... Uh, did, did I cover everything in this episode? Do we have anything else to talk about? I'm sure there is. I wanted to mention the scene where Ahsoka force communicates with Sabine, like a uh, force time in the sequels with Kylo Ren and Rey. Um, it was kind of similar to that, but I thought it was way more similar to the High Republic. Um, a couple Jedi are able to communicate like that. And the way they described it was spot on to what I thought was happening here, where they're not talking, but they're able to... like empathically send feelings that if you know each other well enough you're able to Mm -hmm. discern communication and like very basic messages from and that's exactly what i thought was represented on the screen and i thought having read that before gave me such a deeper understanding of what i thought was happening and then i thought i was going to be wrong because um she was like talking and you could hear her echoing and then ezra asked what happened and sabine just said she had a feeling like she didn't hear sabine's voice or she didn't hear ahsoka's voice she just felt her presence in the force and was able to yeah. discern a message that's what i was talking about earlier with the the praying thing and that mm. was a perfect perfect lead in as, as well i know that's such a weird thing to, <laughs> to shoehorn in randomly during a podcast um but yeah i, I love that moment and I, I think it does strengthen even the sequel trilogy again when you're rewatching everything as a whole it's like oh yeah this has happened multiple times now um which again Filling in those cracks and those ga- those gaps um, for those who are less forgiving, I guess. 
Um, but yeah, I love I love that moment as well. Um, Maxwell, do you have anything as well off the top of your head? Uh, no, I th- I think that just about covers it. I also mentioned earlier they looks like they're just for the Chimera that they're building the action figure Hot Toy set already since it's just implanted on top of that building. Mm-hmm. It just looks like the stand. Yeah, they you, should just do. You just got to bulk up the stand a little bit more because they do have Super Star Destroyer Lego mm-hmm. sets or Star Destroyer Lego sets, and they have it on a stand not dissimilar from what that yeah. pyre looks like. If you can you imagine if you just had like a little like it's like the like the town around it, um, and then it's also are we ever gonna get whatever Balin Skull is going for? Do you think it has to do with those screaming statues that we saw in the when they first arrived in this galaxy? No, what are probably, those? Probably not. I would say distantly yes, because I think there's a lot of mm, a lot of lore surrounding this planet that we don't yet know that I think yeah. Balin does, and I'm I'm assuming those are all kind of intertwined with each other. Yeah, man, I'm interested. Any theories how they're going to get back? Also, I think they all got to go back in the Star Destroyer in the Eye of Scion. What happens to the Chimera? The Chimera docks into the Eye of Scion. Yeah. Like a hyperspace ring. That for sure is going to go. Yeah, because they just loaded all those bodies up. And they're like, all right, we're going to leave them now. (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad that you said bodies. I was listening to another Star Wars podcast that was talking about um, uh, those coffins. Name names. And I forget which one, actually. Let's tag them. But they they were talking for a while about what they think could be in those boxes. And I was like... I think that's very clearly coffins, right? I think there's yes. dead bodies in there. Did, yeah, I would so be that, I'd be shocked if there's not dead bodies. In yeah, those. so that they can reanimate them, and then those can be the soldiers. Oh, yes, but let's talk about that though, because we assumed that Thrawn's army of stormtroopers were reanimated as well. But when they were shot or sliced, they did not explode into a green puff of smoke. That's like, a good ooh, call. That's true. I did not think about that. That's interesting. Hmm. Still don't know about Enoch. Maybe he is the only ghost. So, so maybe, uh, maybe the night troopers that we've seen so far are the only surviving actual uh, stormtroopers, and all the dead bodies are the ones that are going to be reanimated. Who knows? Yeah, that's a great point. Could be. But then why not just reanimate them now? Because they expire. I mentioned that last week. Yeah, maybe you, maybe, just gotta, maybe you can only do it once. It. It's a one-time transfer, and they just got to bulk them all up for one thing. I don't know. Who knows? I think I, we'll, I have a feeling we'll find out. Yeah, I'm very excited for episode eight, um, which is last, you know, next week or last week of I know, the, uh, the season uh, finale. That's yep. crazy. I don't feel prepared. No, you know why? Because I, I don't think, I not that I wanted more to happen because everything has happened these past eight weeks. With that being said, I'm excited to get back to our normal schedule of not recording on a Tuesday night <laughs> and 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 hurriedly uh, getting these out the day after. Yeah. Um, but That'd I'm also nice. excited for what we have in store for the next couple of weeks. I'm excited to see what happens in Ahsoka next week. Obviously that's going to be a huge episode. Um, and, uh, I don't know if there's like three other things I was going to mention, honestly. Um, but man, I'm loving this show. I'm excited to see what's next. I'm hopefully skeleton crew. Will, there's no way skeleton crew is coming out in November. I just realized it's no. almost October. <laughs> I was like, well, we have four days till October and we have not seen a trailer. So there's no way. Um, anyway, does anybody have any force for thought? I do, yes. I wanted to talk real quick about the first scene in episode six of Ahsoka um, where Hu Yang was telling the story to Ahsoka and obviously he says, you know, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away and that's great. It's very meta, um, but that's not the only meta part in that story that we kind of overlooked um, because there was a part where Hu Yang mentions uh, the histories of the galaxy parts one, two, and three and uh, Ahsoka makes a very meta comment where she says, yes, one being the best. And I thought about that and I was like, oh my gosh, that's so funny because this is written by Dave Filoni and Dave Filoni loves the prequels so much. And I was like, wait, no. Would one be the original trilogy? Because that was the first one that came out. And then I, I started thinking about it and I'm like, I feel like that's a very meta comment, but I have no idea what they're trying to say with that. But I feel like it's meta because then they, they send it home with the galaxy far, far away bit. So I'm like, they're definitely talking about Star Wars. Yeah, I agree. And that's a, I, I had that same thought that they are making a meta comment about how everyone has their trilogy that they love and they will always insert that that one's their favorite into conversation, even though it's not really about that. And they did that in a very smart way where they didn't pick whether they're really endorsing the original trilogy or the prequel trilogy, it's pretty obviously not the sequel trilogy because it's one. That's the only one getting the (laughs) shaft. (laughs) Um, That was a a very smart way to kind of bring attention to the way the fans interact with Star Wars in a way that you don't disprove or discredit anyone's love. 
Yeah. So any, I thought that was really interesting. That's my little bit of force for thought. Let us know what you think. Do you think they were talking about the original trilogy, the prequel trilogy? And like Matt said earlier, make sure you follow along. We got some really exciting stuff planned ahead in the coming weeks. So make sure you uh, like, subscribe, follow, give us a rating, do whatever it is you can do wherever you're listening to us. It goes a long way and helps the show. Exactly. We have a lot of things planned because Max is going on vacation, so we have to have them planned. Yes. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, until next week. See you, Sammy.